Hey everyone, this is Bathmetrics. Welcome to episode 13 of Mixing Loud with Clip to Zero. In this video, I'm going to talk about the busing strategies that can help the CTZ approach yield a good result. And in the course of doing this, I'm going to be taking you on a tour of my own project template where I apply those busing strategies. Before I start, remember this is part of an ongoing uh, playlist called Mixing Loud with the Clip to Zero strategy. We're all the way up to episode 13 now, but there's been a whole bunch of stuff we've talked about up to this point. And uh, I'm assuming you've seen or at least skimmed this stuff and are familiar with the terms and concepts I'm going to be throwing around. Maybe subscribe to my channel. There's still a lot more things still coming. This is where we are now. I'm still going to be covering all these topics down here. So if you subscribe, you'll be aware of them as soon as they come out. Okay, before I start, I'm just going to show you this clip and let you pause the video and maybe study it a little bit. I'm going to be referring back to some subjects I've covered in much more depth back in episodes two, six, seven, and also maybe one other episode. And these are all earlier concepts and principles that I've demonstrated that lend themselves to what I'm about to suggest about busing strategies, okay? And we'll just focus on one of them right now, which is uh, this section of lines up here. Back in episode two, we explained as part of the overall reason why CTZ works so well is because it forces you to make many small amounts of clipping throughout your project on every individual track. At every bus point that all your tracks sum into, there's a clipper. So you're doing all these lots of little razor paper cuts all throughout your project. And for various reasons, explained back in episode two, that sounds much better than if you just work at a very low gain staging level, create these huge dynamic transient caterpillar looking waveforms with huge tall spiky peaks, and then try to run that through one round of clipping or limiting and squash all those peaks off in one go. It just doesn't sound as good. So that's one concept that applies to the busing strategy. Many clips is better than one big clip. Another thing we talked about in episode six is that um, the more complex the signal on any given bus, the less clipping it can withstand. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you have a, a simple percussive snare sound, you can clip that a lot and you're not gonna hear it. It's gonna be super transparent. If you put a bunch of different hi-hat sounds together in a, a bus full of different hi-hat sounds, and you clip that whole bus, you're gonna be able to clip it a fair amount because those sounds are all pretty similar. They're all pretty transient and sharp. They live in a certain frequency range, right? So they can tend to stand a fair amount of clipping. Now, by contrast, if you mix a sub bass track and a couple aggressive mid bass tracks, and then a, a dark sounding piano chord track and a vocal track, and drum tracks together in one bus and try and clip that very complex signal that's just all over the frequency spectrum and exhibiting different kinds of internal microdynamics among the different sounds, that track you're not gonna be able to clip very far, that bus, you won't be able to clip very far uh, before you start hearing the clipping. And that's not where we wanna go. We want our clipping to be as masked and transparent as possible. So, you know, I, I pointed this out in episode six, and I just really want to reiterate that here because it's a big part of why I'm going to recommend a, a certain busing approach. And then finally, I also pointed out in episode six that when you clip at all your bus points, it can expose flaws in the way that you're arranging and sequencing your music and in certain mixing decisions you commonly make, like especially related to EQ and side chaining and ducking. So you put all three of these little facts together and it kind of lends itself to a general principle I want you to just take home. If you don't take home anything else from this particular episode, remember this. The more different buses and sub buses you have, the more you're gonna end up with lots of little clips 
instead of one big clip, and that's good. The other thing that's going to happen is you're going to notice flaws faster. And when you notice a flaw, it's going to be a lot easier to fix the thing that's causing the flaw. In other words, if one particular bus is sounding overclipped because of the sounds that are being summed together at that bus, well, you only have to dig around inside that bus on the tracks in there to find the problem and fix the problem. Okay. If you don't hear the result of the clipping until, you know, two or three big chunks along the way to your master, that's a lot more tracks you have to try and figure out where is the problem actually originating from? Where is my arrangement problem? Where is my mixing decision problem, right? So by breaking your project apart into lots of discrete and different sub-buses, it makes finding and fixing flaws easier. It just does. So I'm not going to jump into the next topics on this card yet. Let's focus a little bit on those points I just summarized. This is my project bus. This is what it starts out looking like. As you've seen in previous videos, uh, every one of these folders is a bus. Every one of these folders, well, most of them contain tracks. And all of these folders have a thing called bus CTZ, bus CTZ, bus CTZ, and so on, right? This is my bus clipper. So every one of these buses is getting clipped. That's number one. Next thing you'll notice is there's a lot of them. And there's even more hiding inside some of them. Like my midline bus has a lot of other sub buses inside of it. Okay, but it'll be easier for you to understand it if I kind of collapse everything to this level. At the highest level of my project, I personally like to keep my drums very separate from my tonal sounds until the last minute, and they only get summed together at the very end. Ignore the pre-master for now. Just pretend that these two things are going straight to the master, okay? So right up to the very end, if I open up SciScope Pro and we look at our drum bus, our tonal bus, and layer them together. Right, you can see how the two buses are interacting. I've got oscilloscopes on each bus. You can see the sidechain ducking that's happening that's keeping all these tonal sounds from overlapping with the really full scale kicks and snares. And so that's making sure that there isn't a problem by taking super loud drum hits and then piling a whole bunch more sounds on top of those drum hits to make really massive peaks that have to be clipped even harder, right? In the type of music I produce in the very small dynamic range I work in, kicks and snares are just stretched to within an inch of their life. They are right at the breaking point or even just a little over the breaking point. Like this snare hit could be a little snappier. It's already been clipped pretty hard, but it's still at a point where if you didn't hear the unclipped snare, you wouldn't think anything of it. You just go, okay, yeah, that sounds like a typical snare in a song like this, right? Okay, so these are already squeezed within an inch of their life. And that's the main reason I keep my drum sound separate to the very end is so I can maintain very tight awareness and control of what's being summed with these things. If I just had a big mishmash project and the drums were getting summed in with other sounds much earlier, I'd have no idea, you know, what my, what's really happening with these very important framework and anchor sounds, okay? They need to own the full scale and I need to be able to clearly always tell that they're owning this space and nothing else is masking with them or summing with them, okay. So that's why I do this. And then for the drums themselves, I find it very useful to have a sub bus for my kicks, for my snares and my tops. They're separate sounds. They live in different parts of the frequency spectrum. I EQ and process them differently. And I even wanna have you know scopes on each one so I can see what they look like individually. If I turn on the kick, snare, tops, turn these two things off. Right? This helps me when I'm doing my drum design and, and making my drum bus sound the way I want it to. Okay. 
And it helps me ensure things like, am I, am I ducking my top sounds when the kick hits? Because again, I don't want anything summing with important, hard, high volume parts of the kick or with the kick and the snare. See, there's no green here. So, you know, it's partly because they're processed differently. It's partly because I want to see scopes that tell me what these three types of sounds in my drum bus are doing, that I just have them in separate um, sub buses. And then over on the tonal side of things, what's going on here is primarily breaking apart my sounds again, kind of by the frequency spectrum they tend to live in and the type of job they have in my mix, right? Vocals are pretty obviously their own thing. Not every song has vocals, but when you do have vocals, they need to be processed a very certain way. They need fine care and feeding. Um, you need to do things to make sure they sit right out front on top of your mix and aren't being obscured by other sounds, um, other especially mid-range sounds like synths and leads and so on. So they need to be in their own bus. Subs, for the same reason, need to be in their own bus. They need to live way down low in the spectrum, get their own kind of processing, and you really need to carefully make sure that they're uh, playing nicely with your kick in particular. So what's going on with midline and interjects? Interjects is its own weird thing that's kind of specific to um, festival-oriented bass music genres, where we may already have an aggressive kind of call and response line going on if it's dubstep or rhythm, or we might have uh, you know, some sort of hypnotic rolling bass line going on if it's mid-tempo bass, or you know, there's just this kind of ongoing pattern that is the bulk of our drop, but we also like to throw in really weird interjected sounds for sudden surprise and contrast. So right in the middle of some, you know, repeatable pattern you're hearing, suddenly you'll get this weird glitchy thing that's like the only sound you hear for a, a few milliseconds. And it's just like, whoa, what was that, right? So that's called an interject. And the easiest way to insert interjects into a project and be able to play with their timing in very micro increments and not have to do detailed editing in your arrangement timeline. The easiest thing to do is throw them all in a bus together and set things up so that anytime any sound actually happens on this interjects bus, it triggers a reverse gate over on the bus that you want to completely make disappear for that moment. And it we use a gate instead of a shaped ducker, like instead of this kind of shaped ducker, you use a hard gate that just slams open and shut, open and shut, open and shut. And it just basically is set up so that anytime a sound happens here, it instantly gates this thing quiet. So this is the only sound in the mix. And then the minute this sound stops, this gate closes again and everything just like comes right back into full swing from this bus and it's instant. So that's all that's going on with the interjects bus. I don't need to say much more about that. Now the midline bus is breaking up all the mid-range sounds in ways that I think are useful spectrally and functionally. You know, piano chords or any kind of chordal sound is usually a little bit pushed in the background depth-wise, and it's also usually pushed a little bit out to the side so that it isn't competing with the things in the middle of the mix that you want to stand out and be more obvious to the listener's attention. By contrast, melodic sounds, plucks, leads, um, arpeggios, things like that, often you want them to cut through right in the middle of the mix and be a little more upfront in the depth stage. So they take very different kinds of processing and it really helps to separate them out into their own individual buses. Drop sounds are specific to bass music. It's all the crazy weird sound design stuff we do, the glitchy stuff that isn't melodic at all. It's just noises of various weird and interesting kinds. Uh, and so they get their own treatment and their own bus. And then in dance music, we make a lot of use of uplifters and downlifters, and they often need washout effects put on them and other tricks. And so, you know, they get their own bus, atmospheres and foleys, your low dark beds way deep in the background. They're usually pushed into the background in various ways with EQ. 
uh, and with reverb. And so um, they get their own bus processing and Foley sounds are, they're just weird textural glitchy things that are super low in volume. You barely notice them. They're almost subliminal and they're not, they're not like the glitchy sounds we sometimes use in drums. Like I always have what I call a spice machine that is weird glitchy sounds being used as part of my drum line. And they're rhythmic. They play a fundamental part of the drum feel and beat and rhythm, right? But Foley sounds are a little more randomized and just there for background texture. You know, we're talking like little little subliminal breaking glass sounds and crumpled paper sounds and rocks being kicked and scuffed under shoes and just, you know, Foley, like, like you know, from the movie industry. And we'll put weird little things in the background uh, just to add a kind of ambiance that's in addition to the atmospheric sounds. And so this is this needs to be its own kind of EQ decisions and you know hidden in the background nicely with with depth tricks and so it gets its own bus right. But all of these are broadly mid range sounds focused in the mid range, and so you could say broadly that midline and interjects is all my mid range stuff. Vocals is its own thing entirely. Yes, it's mid range, but it's vocals. It needs to sit on top of everything else, and then subs need to live where they, where they do. And that's all my tonal stuff, and that's why I, I break this up the way I do. And again, every bus, every bus has a bus clipper on it, right? And then inside any one of these buses, any one of my individual tracks where sounds originate from, they have a track clipper at the end. And this is all stuff I've talked about in previous episodes, why you do this. So lots of little paper cuts, lots of clipping all the way up through the project. Now, what may be interesting to y'all um, that's a little different and unique about my busing, all of this may have made a lot of sense so far, but what's this pre-master? Why does Baffy use a pre-master? Well, you do not need to use a pre-master. You don't have to do what I'm doing. Don't get too confused by this. Don't overthink it. For me, it's really simple. Your master bus can get really overloaded with a ton of final processing chains, right? And if you think about what you typically do on your master bus, the first half of it is usually spectral processing. It's like final little EQ changes and things that are sound gooder plugins like Gullfoss, or you put your favorite vintage tape saturation up there in the front of your mastering chain. And it's all these things you do to color the sound and put little rainbow sparkles on it and glitter and sharpen it up and brighten it up and make it just right, right? It's like, you know, you've got this raw mix and it finally all ends up on your master track and you do a little bit of final polish and shine on it. And that's one type of processing we tend to do on our master. And then after all that, you put on your dynamics processing for the final mastering, right? So that's where you start bringing in your SSLG style bus compression and any final mastering limiter. And those of us in the know probably put a clipper right in front of that mastering limiter and kind of split the final limiting work between partly being done by the clipper and partly being done by the mastering limiter. Because as I point out over and over, mastering limiters do not like to work. They're supposed to be incredibly transparent. They have one job, and that's just to catch final peaks from all of your pretty processing, all the little magic fairy dust stuff that you do. They're just supposed to catch those final peaks and make sure nothing is going over a certain ceiling. And they're supposed to do it completely transparently. But of course, too many people don't use mastering limiters in a transparent way because they make them work way too hard. They throw way too big of a spiky high crest factor signal into them and ask them to crunch ridiculous amounts of gain reduction on those peaks. And it sounds terrible. And that's, you know, these are all points I made in episode two, <laughs> why you don't want to do that. So certainly, you know, you really don't want your mastering limiter working hard. And so it often makes sense to do even a tiny bit of clipping of the signal of the biggest, tallest peak so that the final peaks you're feeding to the mastering limiter are just little short softballs, right? That it can handle really well and nicely and transparently. Um, but people load up their master 
bus. And then if you're like me and you're also using um, special plugins for room correction software or special plugins that let you check your mix translation across a lot of different environments, those all you know, get added into the end of the mastering chain too. And you have to remember to turn them off before you actually print a master or bounce stems to hand off to a collab partner. And it's real easy to forget to turn something off. You should turn off and it just gets messy. Master buses just get messy. So it can be really helpful to offload a lot of that stuff to other buses. And so I do that in two ways. The first thing I do is I make a pre-master bus that is really conceptually the real true mix bus in my project, my two bus. This is my two bus, not this. And what I do here is the spectral stuff, the coloration stuff, the final EQ. That's what smart EQ is for. Uh, Golfos is an amazing processor. It works magic on some mixes, on other mixes, not so much, but it's just this very interesting process that can sound really good and really open up a mix in great ways. In some cases, it's not perfect. It's not universally perfect, but I tend to use it where it does make sense. And uh, so it's sitting here ready to be activated and used. And sometimes I use um, an old vintage style tape saturation. So I've got Slate's virtual tape machine sitting here. And they're deactivated by default, but if I'm going to use them and see how they sound on a particular mix, this is where I'll do it. And I keep it conceptually separated from what goes on my master, which is only literally a mastering compressor, some sort of SSLG style bus compression at the end, uh, a clipper and a limiter. That's it. That's all that ever goes on my master. And right now, all I have on it is the clipper right? Because I, I just want something super lightweight to catch any peaks that may be, you know, caused by anything I turn on over here to audition and see what it sounds like. I just want this to act like a limiter and do all the limiting. But later when I'm in final mastering stage, I'll add an actual limiter after this and I'll split the work between this clipper and the limiter following it. And then in front of this, I might try a mastering compressor if I think this particular mix might benefit from mastering compression from a SSLG styles, very lightweight bus compression. And so all that ever happens on my mastering chain is final dynamics. And then the metering stuff and the fancy room correction stuff and the fancy mix translation stuff and all the things that you normally have to remember to turn off if you put them on your master track, I put them on something that comes after my master track called the listen bus. Now, some DAWs have a listen bus built into them. Studio One has a listen bus that's just part of the DAW and it sits right here next to the master. It's great. Um, Cubase has a listen bus I found out the other day. They call it the control room and it's this weird little widget with a bunch of knobs and dials and I don't know how it works, but it is a listen bus. Um, but DAWs like Bitwig and Ableton, they don't come with a listen bus. Logic, I don't think it has a listen bus. So you have to make one if you want one, okay? You don't have to, you can, you can load up your master track just like many of us did for years and years. But if you can make a listen bus, it's convenient. I mean, look at all the stuff I put on my listen bus. All these different metering tools. Here's my Slate VSX, which is my translation software that I use to check my mix across a whole bunch of virtual environments, right? I think it's wonderful. I know some people have theoretical problems with it, but I think it's a bee's knees. And I, I can vouch for the fact that it helps my mixes a lot. Um, helps my mixes to translate, I should say. So, and then I've got all these metering tools on here and it's like, why should I load up my master bus with all this junk? I turn it on and off as I need it. It's just sitting over here in a whole different bus. Great, it's what I use it for. Um, and a listen bus is effectively just a carbon copy of the master, but it comes after the master and it only affects the sound that's going out to your speakers and headphones. In every DAW, the master is where the print actually happens. It's where your WAV file is created from. You can't usually change that. It's where all your stem bounces come from. They come from this bus, period. So you don't want a lot of junk on here. You have to remember to turn off. Um, before you print a master or bounce some stems. It's going to be different in every DAW if a DAW will even allow you to build your own 
listen bus. It's going to be different. I can show you how it's done in Bitwig. It's a very simple concept. In uh, Bitwig, we have this concept of the studio input output, and it is related to our audio settings where we define all the channels, our input channels from our sound card and our output channels that are on the sound card. Like outputs one and two from my Motu M4 are going to my monitors and headphones and outputs three and four are an auxiliary line out to go to analog gear. Um, and so all this translates into this thing called the Studio IO, which is basically just, you can set up different groups kind of for queuing and are you going out to monitors and headphones or are you just going out to this monitor or that monitor? You can have stuff set up here. And the basic idea is whatever you're set to output to here is just this general output called studio. And so normally on the master track, the output of the master track would be the audio output called studio to go out to your speakers and headphones. But to set up a listen bus, what you do instead is you create some other track somewhere, like this one, and you set its output to studio. And the minute you do that, you're able to go back over to your master and say, okay, I want to send my output of the master not directly to the studio, but over to that other track that is connected to the studio outputs. And so I set my master to just send its signal to the listen bus instead of directly to the outs. And that's how you create a listen bus. It's that simple. Now, I don't know why. You can't do this in Ableton. It's not as simple in Ableton. That you have to use weird tricks in Ableton that I'm not familiar with, but other people I'm sure can, if you say, how do I do this in Ableton? They'll be able to help you out. And then Logic, I, I wouldn't have a clue, or FL Studio. Maybe they've got something native, maybe they don't, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is if you can make a listen bus easily, by all means do it. It's very convenient, but it's not important. It's not necessary. It's not part of the clip to zero strategy. So don't overthink this or worry too much if you have trouble making a listen bus in your projects. Okay, and uh, I think the only weird thing about my template that has nothing at all, well, it kind of has something to do with clip to zero. So let's show it to you. I have this track in my projects called structure and I put it at the very beginning. It doesn't have any inputs or outputs. It's just a dead track. And the only thing I use it for is two purposes. Number one, I'll use it to put a clip and name a clip like this could be intro. Um, this track here could be drop. Okay, so I can, I can name these little clips. And they're just like a MIDI clip, but they're empty, right? Uh, I can name them. I can give them a color. And then, you know, when I play with my section arrangement here, like in Ableton and Bitwig, this is a, a cool thing called the clip launcher. And it allows you to, you know, have all kinds of clips for different sounds that are being blended together into scenes or chunks, right? And you can launch the scene as a whole with these buttons up here. You can stop scenes with a button from up here and I could have a different combination of clips over here that are part of scene two and three and so on. And then, um, and so now I'm ready to actually arrange it on the arranger timeline and start doing some fine tuning and detail on that timeline. Lots of micro editing and sweeps and automation and chopping and glitching and doing weird things to these basic loop based patterns. Okay. So if I give them a label, I can literally just drag the scene over and drop it in and then scroll over and drop the next scene in here and just kind of, you know, bit by bit, chunk by chunk, lay out an arrangement in my timeline. And now I have a starting timeline to start editing and detailing. Uh, and it's a very convenient way of working. It's, it's one of the things I've always liked about both Bitwig and Ableton. Um, so this lets me give them names. And then when I'm over here working, I can simply click on the name of the clip to jump my cue marker to the beginning of that section. And I know I'll start playing from the beginning of that section. Or I, I say, oh, let me focus on my drop section now. And then, of course, this would normally be longer, but 
you know, it just jumps my cue marker right to that drop section. So I use these kind of like cue markers with big visible names and colors on them. And that's all it is. It's just a convenient way to do markers. But it also plays one other useful trick for me. And this goes back to the um, episode I did about the VCA trick, episode eight, where if you remember, we had this concept of being able to pull all of your signals down out of the clipper cascade or push it up harder into the clipper cascade by having these little gain knobs at every source track and they're all linked together in the same group. Well, for convenience, since my structure track is always there at the top of my arrangement, no matter how much I've collapsed folders up or not, right? Um, or since it's always here at the left side of my arrangement in the mixing view, um, this, this little plugin is always ready for me to grab and it's the master knob that just controls all those VCA gain adjustments all across my project. So it's just a convenient place for me to put the, uh, the main knob that controls my entire clipping cascade. Want it more clipped, less dynamic, turn the knob up. Want it less clipped and more dynamic and, and quieter, turn the knob down. One place, so it's just a convenient place to stick one extra knob to get to no matter what shape my project is is in, in terms of what I'm looking at, what I'm focusing on. It's just always right there. You know, there are certain tracks you really want to look at in terms of like, what's ducking what? And did I forget to duck something? Like everything needs to be ducked to your kicks and your snares if you're in uh, the electronic dance music world, right? Because again, if we look at a uh, size scope over here on my listen bus, and we go back to looking at just the drums and the tonal bus. So, you know, it's very important to understand your side chaining and to understand clearly that you're pushing everything out of the way of your important framework sounds that need to eat up the full scale to all the way to zero. So in my typical project, that's always the kick and the snare. And by putting um, oscilloscopes on very strategic buses, it can help you double check that every step of the way. And so, you know, definitely think about a busing structure that helps you see and confirm visually why something sounds a little weird. Because one of the flaws you'll run into in arrangement is you'll forget to duck something that really should be ducked. Like you'll add a new track or a new bus and you'll set up some side chain duckers on it. Like, you know, here on my midline bus, I have kick duckers and snare duckers, right? And at first the ducks might be too short. You'll just eyeball it and say, oh, you know, I'll try a ducking shape this long. And then you'll listen to it and you'll go, wow, I don't know, something just sounds a little rough edge. Something, something isn't sounding right. And you can come to a scope like this and say, all right, well, what's going on with that? And instantly you can see this little change I made here. Suddenly we have this huge overlap of yellow signal from this one midline bus, right? My mid-range sounds on my tonal bus. I just changed this and now I've got all this overlapping energy and sure enough, that's a huge, massive, spiky, transient peak that has to get clipped all of a sudden. And that clipping is right where the very sensitive part of the kick and the snare live, the sine wave tail of the kick and the snare, right? That gets clipped off and that's gonna make my kick sound like crap. So you have to side chain this stuff out of the way of the kick. So if we go back to layers and you can use this kind of view to help you fine tune how long the shape should be as well as your ears. Right? So the question is, well, where's the perfect amount? Where should this be set? I mean, how do I do that visually? Well, the easy way to do it, uh, if you're on Windows, it's very easy as you go to the summed view or you go to a bus where you can see the summed view and you watch the actual place where clipping is occurring and adjust this until you've minimized the clipping, but you're not hearing audible pumping or gapping that you can't live with. So check this out. 
Now here we've got tons of clipping, it's summing up, so it's getting clipped like crazy. But if I keep moving it in this direction to the right, eventually I'm gonna be able to smooth that out and it's still gonna sound like there isn't an audible pumpy gap to our ears. And now you see this kick hit has absolutely nothing summing up with it and having to, you know, forcing some cl upstream clipper or limiter to squash that kick and start making it sound too clipped or too squashed, right? And so that's that's what you do. You, you use these oscilloscopes at strategic bus points to help you visualize and fix problems you're seeing. Like I still see a little bit of a poke right here on this combined snare hit. So let's go in here and adjust this just a little bit more. See, and I'm still not hearing any audible gapping or pumping because of the way that this particular kick and snare sound uh, it's just dovetailing nicely. And now I don't have any clipping even over here on the snare side of thing, or just the tiniest, tiniest bit right here. Uh, and that's, you know, a very useful thing to do with your, your buses is think about where is the best place to put scopes, mainly to help me double check my side chaining and, and understand how signals are summing together understand where they're overlapping each other in ways that might not be desirable and are creating too much additional peaks and energy for clippers to be smacking into, which will make it sound rougher and dirtier and you'll start hearing the clipping. The whole goal is to mix and make decisions in a way that hides the clipping as much as possible. So you can't hear it, it should be transparent. It's like trying to set up lots of tiny little transparent limiters all across every little step and stage of your project. And it sounds overwhelming, but really it's not. Once you once you do a project or two and play with these concepts that I've been showing you, it's just second nature. It's just super obvious and easy. Okay, so we have one last thing to talk about. Aux returns, FX tracks, they do pose a special challenge. And I talked about this subject in more detail back in episode seven. So you can go back and see what I said there, but just to talk about it one more time in the context of a project template and the way you should think about your busing structure. This is uh, pretty tricky and every DAW is a little bit different and that's what makes it challenging. I wanna focus on three basic concepts about aux returns. First thing to understand is if you sum all of them directly at the master, you're gonna end up with one large clip, right? But if you can somehow sum smaller chunks of return buses at smaller points in your project, you're gonna have more little clips, right? So it's the one big clip versus many little clips problem. And the final thing to kind of point out is you also have to remember to side chain duck your aux returns to things like the kick and the snare, or they're kind of a hidden ninja that messes you up and you don't understand why your kick and snare might be clipping. So this may seem a little confusing just talking about it abstractly with this slide here. So let me point and show you things in my project to help you understand this better. The big problem is this. I'm gonna just collapse my buses up for a second here. In most DAWs, nearly every DAW, by default, when you set up an FX track, like when you say add, an effect track, or some DAWs call them return tracks, some DAWs call them aux tracks, right? The whole idea is you have this set of tracks that are usually stuck over here next to your master track. And they're this special group that you send information to with um, sends and returns that look kind of like this. You'll have a set of knobs or buttons or something below certain tracks. And you can say, okay, I want to send this much signal from this track to a reverb that's sitting over here on a group of effects returns or aux tracks, right? 
And then for a different thing, like my snares, I want to send a different amount of signal to that same reverb or delay or whatever. And typically what you mostly tend to use return tracks for, or aux tracks, are reverbs and delays. Although we can use them creatively for all kinds of stuff, so it's not by all means limited to that. But it's usually for taking various tracks in your project and sending them to a single shared reverb or delay so that they sound as if they're recorded in and living in the same physical space, right? Like if you record a real drummer playing a real drum set in a real room, you've got all these close mics next to various drum heads and you've got close mics next to the various cymbals. But then you've also got a pair of overhead mics and maybe even another room mic somewhere in the room that's capturing the ambiance, the reflections, the distant sounds from the drum kit. And the mixer will combine all these things in a very artful way so that it sounds like a real live organic drum player in a room in front of you because there's all these subtle cues from the reflections that tell us this is a whole bunch of different drum sounds occupying a real space, right? So drum kits are the classic thing that you can understand aux and return tracks. Now, the thing is you have your dry drum sounds, all your close mic stuff over here in your main project in the bus structure, but then you've got a bunch of returns with you know the reverbed room sounds from the drum that are emulating those room mics, okay? And what happens is all these return tracks are running in parallel to your main track and bus structure. They're not actually folded into the main track and bus structure by default. Instead, they're just sitting out here all on their own as a parallel set of sounds. And then at the very last minute on the master track is where all these return tracks get summed together with your original dry tracks. So it's like a wet dry mix here on your master. And you control the amount of wet and dry by the amount that you're sending into the return tracks. Now, that's a problem when you're playing in super loud genres and you've already got signals that are taking up the full scale of your available amplitude, your available headroom. Having a whole set of aux returns over here that are being summed with all this information coming from your main track structure, if, if you've got even more information, some reverbs and delays sitting over here that suddenly get added in on top of all this at the very last minute at the master, well, that's a problem because now you're summing a bunch of additional energy, you know, potentially with these kicks and snares that are themselves being fed into some of these aux tracks. And if you don't see it until the last minute, or you don't even know really consciously that it's happening, because we, we tend to think of these as just being sort of extra things off to the side, and somehow magically it's part of this track structure. At least new producers may think that at first, right? And it's real easy to forget that it's completely separate. And if you've got a bunch of oscilloscopes sitting over here telling you what's happening in your main track structure, like this picture, it's not necessarily showing you the final merging and summing from all your aux sends that are getting piled on top of this information. And so I've had people say, you know, I've, I've done everything you've said, my kicks and snares look good, but then I still feel like they're clipping. And I ask questions and inevitably it's because they're not thinking about what the aux tracks are doing. So this is where things get tricky, right? Certain DAWs don't let you modify this structure at all, okay? At most, you can maybe create other return tracks inside here and do subgroupings within the returns, but even the sub buses you might make within the return tracks over here are still kept separate from your main track structure until the very end when they're all summed together in parallel on the master. So what I'm about to show you isn't possible in every DAW, and I'm sorry for that, okay? So one of the reasons I love Bitwig, and it's my main DAW, is because it's very, very flexible in the way you can route signals around and group things. And Bitwig allows you to actually create return, sends them returns that are inside of the track structure and even inside of specific groups. So what you're seeing here 
is in my drum group, my drum bus, I've set up its own little set of sends and returns. And basically what I've got on this track is just one reverb. It's Denise Perfect Room, which is a great reverb, very natural sounding. And I'm sending a certain amount of my kicks and my snares into this one reverb channel. Now, in a real project, I may end up with more returns. I may end up using some delays, some slightly different reverbs. And like, for example, my top sounds might you know, also go into perfect room, but they might also go into something else. I might put some extra delay on some of the spicy sounds um, to, to kind of push them out wider and push them into the background. Um, so there's all kinds of tricks I could be using here with return tracks to make all this stuff sound like it's living in an organic space. And I may want to have multiple return tracks that are then grouped into a single bus. And the reason I would want to take my different drum returns or aux channels and group them into a single bus like this is because I want to duck those sounds to my kick and snare. I don't even want, like if I've got any kind of, even the reverb that's on my kick and snare, right, itself, I want to completely duck that signal when these kicks and snares are happening, okay? I don't want anything added on top of the dry kick and snare. I, I want any kind of reverb tail from the kick and snare to happen around the same time as my other aux sends. Maybe I'll let them crossfade in a little bit earlier. But I'll have a set of duckers here that are controlling exactly when I allow these reverbed kicks and ducks to come back in after the initial punch of the kick and the snare. I don't want anything summing up right at this point, only later. And so this is a very short ducking slice so that it sounds natural, but it's, you know, it's letting me very surgically control how and when the reverb tail of the kick and the snare is happening. And that helps me control the total amount of energy and how much, you know, I'm needing to ultimately clip my, my kick and snare. So in Bitwig, you can do this sort of surgical interior inside the project send and return structure with individual FX tracks, as well as taking all of those FX tracks and routing them over to a, a group, which I'm doing like this. So... If you kind of look here, here's my two sends going to my perfect room track. And the perfect room track, instead of sending this directly to my drums bus, I say send this over to this other return track called DR Oxes, drum Oxes. And then this one is what's going back over to my drums master, right? So the signal flow is like this. Kicks, snares, and tops go straight to drums, right? The drums master here at the bottom. But then each of these has a certain amount of send going to an internal effects track that's also inside my drums group, but I'm not letting this effects track go straight to my drums master. Instead, I'm saying send this over to a sub bus just for the effects sends, because in the as the project builds up, I might have more of these, right? And it's this one that I'm finally letting go over to the drums master. And that allows me to have special uh, kick and snare duckers on it. But it's more than just the duckers. It's more than just being able to surgically control when and how all these reverb and delay effects feed back into the drums. It also has to do with the total amount of energy that's getting piled on top of the kick and the snare itself in terms of clipping, okay? So here's the deal. I might also have later in my project um, over my tonal bus, it's very, very common if I'm using vocals of any sort to have a bunch of vocal tracks and they might have their own sets of interior FX delays and reverbs. And so I would have a similar set of internal sends and returns inside my vocals group working very much the same way I've just described for my drum bus. 
And it's also possible that um, I may have some chordal sounds in my midline bus that share a set of reverbs and or delays. And my melodic sounds might share some of those. And so I might have a whole set of interior sends and returns inside my midline bus that are specific to just the midline sounds. Because think about it, you, you don't necessarily want your all your drums and your vocals and your mid-range instruments all sharing exactly the same physical space. I mean, sometimes you do, certainly in more organic genres you do. You know, if you're doing an alternative album or a singer-songwriter guitarist album or a lot of rock albums, yeah, for those you might want a single global set of sends and returns over here next to the master and everything's getting sent into them because that's the sound of those genres. But in electronic dance music, it's a lot more artificial. And a lot of times for mid-range sounds, we'll just put reverbs and delays directly on each individual synth track or drop noise track. And they've all got very different kinds of reverb and delay happening on them. And it's very artificial and not organic sounding, but that's okay because that's the sound of the genre. Okay, so in my productions, typically, I I may or may not have any any kind of um, shared reverbs and delays for my mid-range sounds, but I usually will have at least some shared reverbs for my drums, and if I have vocals in the track, they will definitely have some shared reverbs and delays, right? But I do them inside the busing structure itself in the main project. And this plays back to the point I'm making here about if you can somehow sum smaller chunks, individual discrete chunks of sends and returns, if you can do that at buses inside the project itself, like my drums bus here, that means a smaller amount of extra energy that has to get clipped at the bus level. By contrast, if I were to just, you know, be in a DAW where I'm forced to use a whole bunch of sends and returns over here by the master, and they're all global to the entire project, and they don't get summed in until the very last minute on the master, well, then I'm going to be doing a bigger chunk of final clipping yet again at the very last mile over here on the master bus. So there isn't a necessarily a good way to work around this problem or challenge, I should say, in every DAW. Certain DAWs are going to give you more flexibility here. Like this is one of the reasons I love Bitwig is I have this kind of flexibility to surgically control my ducking and my clipping of all my aux returns for specific individual types of sounds within my project. Your mileage may vary. I'm sorry about that. I can't give you a perfect solution that works in every DAW for this. Do just be aware that if you are in a DAW where you can't do this kind of very group-specific sends and returns, then you're going to have to get, if you can't even get creative and, and fix that somehow within some tricks you can do inside of your aux return structure here, you at least need to be aware that this is posing a challenge for you on your final master bus. And that this first bus clipper on your master bus is going to be suddenly also engaging a lot of sounds that are happening here in your aux returns. And those sounds are going to be stacked on top of whatever's coming out of your main project structure. And it's going to be stacking on top of, you know, your kicks and snares that are probably already stretched to their limit if you're working in electronic, you know, loud electronic dance music genres, suddenly all this information is getting piled on top of these kicks and snares, and that's going to present a, a challenge for you. It really is. I think the best advice I can give you is if you're stuck with a whole bunch of sends and returns over here, you're going to want to make some sort of subgroup inside of this return structure that lets you sidechain duck all of that energy against your kick and snare. Like the thing you see me doing here on my uh, total, my bus for all of my potential reverbs and delays on my drum sounds, 
You see how I've got kick and snare duckers here? You're going to have to figure out how to do something like this over here in your set of sends and returns. It's going to be different for every DAW, how you pull that off. But somehow, you want to make sure you're ducking all that extra energy when your kick and your snare happen so that you're not piling a whole bunch of extra information on top of these kicks and snares at the very last minute on your master bus. So I'm sorry I can't give you a, a perfect one-size-fits-all solution for this. I just need to make you aware of it. It's a, it's a big problem, and it's part of the problem I think a lot of people really struggle with the super loud genres because they may have arrived at some of the concepts and techniques and ideas I've talked about so far in this series. They may have arrived at that themselves, but they kind of either don't realize they need to account for the same thing in their aux returns over here, or they don't know how to account for it. And I guess the best advice I can give you is figure out a way to duck this stuff to your kick and snare. That's going to be the biggest help. If it has to be all done in one chunk over here and clipped in one chunk at your master, at the very least, remove a lot of that energy from the big important parts that can't be having more stuff piled on top of it at the very last minute over here at the master. See if you can figure out some way to do that. And if you are working in a DAW that allows this kind of flexibility, like Bitwig, then of course, I highly recommend doing all your sends and returns in this very group-specific way that I've tried to um, illustrate in my project template. So, I hope this video has been helpful, and I will see you in the next one.